Portland, Oregon. A city of bridges. A city of rivers. A city of rain. The greater metro area is home to nearly 2.5 million people. And just like any major US city, freeways play an essential role in keeping those people moving. Some might say Portland has too many freeways. Some might say it doesn't have enough. Regardless, more cars are driving on these roads every year, but the infrastructure isn't getting any younger. When most of these freeways were being built in the 1960s, they were only the first step of a much grander vision. Portland city planners were working toward a network of freeways and highways that was nearly double of what exists today. The history of these failed projects is fascinating, but it's also incredibly extensive. We'll be exploring just a few pieces of this much bigger story, and highlighting some of the evidence you can still find throughout the city today. In September of 1943, the city of Portland and Multnomah County invited the renowned urban developer Robert Moses to come visit the city. Moses was well known for transforming the boroughs of New York City with his highways, parks, and bridges. Many of the people, by no means all, who call themselves planners uh, are people who uh, uh, make pretty pictures, they draw things. Uh, they present a, a, a plausible and often dramatic, melodramatic program, but they're not people that get anything done. While he was one of the most influential urban developers of the 20th century, he would also become highly controversial. The later decades of his career would see his corruption and racism brought to light. His projects would become notorious for dividing communities, literally, at the cost of his vision for progress. These aspects of his career weren't common knowledge in the early 40s, but in the very least, he was known for his abrasive personality. World War II was still ongoing, but Portland's leaders were looking ahead to how they could revitalize the city and create jobs for returning servicemen once the war was over. This was a progressive outlook at the time, as most other big cities weren't planning ahead for these post-war challenges. Moses was brought in to offer his expertise, and two months later in November, he presented an 87-page report that outlined his vision for the city's future infrastructure. The projects outlined in this report would help modernize Portland in ways it had never seen before. And importantly, it would create 20,000 new jobs in the process. The New York Times described the plan as one of the most comprehensive post-war public works programs in the country. Of course, his plan was really just the playbook to get the city started in the right direction. Urban planners within Portland and the state of Oregon would expand upon these ideas tremendously in the coming years. Few things inspired these plans as much as the Federal Aid Highway Act signed by President Eisenhower in 1956. This introduced the United States to the new concept of interstate highways. The best part was that the federal government would pay 90% of the cost of any approved interstates. This meant that cities could realize their visions for growth, while in many cases only paying a small fraction of the cost. These wider, faster roads fueled Americans' growing love affair with the automobile, in fact, the number of cars on American roads more than doubled during the 1950s. This kicked off Americans' mass movement out to the suburbs, making the highways all the more vital to their daily commutes. Freeways quickly became a mainstay of American life, and this was certainly no exception in Portland. In June of 1955, a year before the Highway Act was signed, the city announced its first rough blueprint for 14 freeways, 14 expressways, and 5 new bridges. These plans weren't set in stone by any means, but they included several more routes than Robert Moses had suggested in the prior decade. Many of these would become the infrastructure we're familiar with today. The first of these projects was already being built, and it opened just four months later in October of 1955. The Banfield Freeway linked the city center with the neighborhoods of Northeast Portland, continuing out of the city as far as Troutdale. With the introduction of the interstate system, this route would soon be signed as I-80 North, known today as I-84. Around the city center itself was what Robert Moses had proposed as the Inner Belt Thruway, with freeways serving both sides of the Willamette River. The route on the east side of the river would become I-5, which opened with the completion of the Markham Bridge in 1966. I-405 opened a few years later in 1969, circling downtown and forming the western half of the loop. 
The loop wouldn't be fully completed until the Fremont Bridge opened a few years later in 1973. Farther east is I-205, which serves as an outer loop that bypasses the city center. This was Portland's last freeway to be built, opening in 1983. The 1955 plan got a few other things right too. But with all that said, half of the proposed routes here would never materialize, although some of them came very close. Now that we know which freeways became a reality, let's take a closer look at three projects that were almost built alongside them. As seen on the 1955 map, there was a route that split off from the Interbelt Thruway and ran up through Portland's Northwest Industrial Area. This was referred to as the Industrial Freeway. In this earliest draft, the freeway would have run a little over 5 miles, ending with a connection to the St. John's Bridge. Since this wasn't a major connecting route, the idea didn't get much traction for over a decade. The city had its hands full with building its major interstates, which remained the top priority through the end of the 60s. But in 1968, Congress approved additional funding for new interstates. With more money up for grabs, the city chose the Industrial Freeway as part of a second wave of new construction. The nearby I-405 was just six months from completion, so the offshoot of the Industrial Freeway was a natural next step. A few months later in December, the future route was designated as Interstate 505. At the time, the proposed length of the route was still being decided. The city briefly explored the idea of extending it to a length of 8 miles running up closer to Savi Island and naming it the St. Helens Freeway. Here it would have hit another expressway that would have run across the West Hills and up into Vancouver, Washington. But these ideas didn't last for long, and soon, I-505 was scaled down to only serve the Northwest Industrial neighborhood. It would have followed Upshur Street for a little over a mile, being depressed below ground level between Thurman and Vaughn Streets. This would form a connection with US Route 30, which at the time ran through the neighborhood along St. Helens Road. As these plans were made public in 1969, local residents were skeptical, but many were initially supportive of the idea. The neighborhood was growing, especially with young professionals and lower middle class families. With this growth came the need for a clear division between its residential and industrial areas, and the freeway would provide just that. But there were plenty of concerns about the project from the start. Nearly 400 residents would be displaced from their homes, and the neighborhood wanted to make sure these people would be properly rehoused. At the same time, Americans were growing increasingly concerned about the environment. The National Environmental Policy Act was introduced in 1970, and required all federal projects to evaluate their environmental impact. Almost immediately, Portland's residents firmly held their freeway planners accountable to this rule. In 1971, the neighborhood filed a class action lawsuit to conduct an environmental survey for I-505. By this time, most residents and business owners weren't satisfied with the Upshur route so the survey would explore the environmental impacts of a few possible alternatives as well. These routes were presented when the survey was completed two years later in 1973. The neighborhood's favorite option, called Long Yeon, would have four elevated lanes along Yeon Avenue to 29th, continuing at grade until being elevated again for a flyover interchange with St. Helens Road. The local industries didn't like this approach, as it had the greatest negative impact on their businesses. But the residents favored it because it would keep the traffic out of their backyards and would minimize the need to tear down homes. The city council agreed and selected the Long Yeon route in 1974. Everything seemed ready to move forward, but not much progress was made over the next few years. By this point, Portland's leaders were facing an onslaught of freeway protests across the city. And within the neighborhood, opponents of I-505 continued to push back on the plans and delay construction. In November of 1978, the city council cut their losses and withdrew their support for I-505. The neighborhood had made their voices heard, and the city didn't consider the route essential enough to keep pushing it any further. A decade later in 1988, US Route 30 was rerouted to Yeon Avenue to alleviate traffic for locals. This alignment follows the route that I-505 would have taken, but of course, it was never built to freeway standards. At least, not entirely. When you exit I-405 onto Route 30, you'll notice that the road continues to resemble a freeway for the better part of a mile, until it hits Nikolai Street. This interchange was partially built in the early 70s during the construction of the Fremont Bridge, and was intended for the future connection to the Industrial Freeway. The ramps originally touched ground at 21st Avenue, 
providing a temporary connection to the surface streets while I-505 was being planned. After the freeway was cancelled, the ramps were repurposed to improve traffic flow in the late 80s, resulting in the interchange as we know it today. Our next point of interest is just across the Fremont Bridge, where I-405 closes the loop with I-5. The stack interchange here is one of the most complex in the city, with a confusing array of overpasses that connect these two major routes. You wouldn't know by looking at it, but this is actually considered incomplete, as it was originally going to accommodate a third freeway as well. Looking back to the 1955 plan, we can see a route that splits off from this interchange into the neighborhoods of Northeast Portland. Another map from a few years later gives us a clear view of the proposed route. Originally called the Fremont Freeway, this would have been about 6 miles long, running along Northeast Fremont Street and bending around Rocky Butte, before merging with the Banfield Freeway. This idea wasn't seriously considered for several years, but it soon gained the new name of the Rose City Freeway. By 1969, I-205 was still far from being built, but its alignment had been mostly figured out after years of local pushback. The proposed route of the Rose City Freeway changed slightly to accommodate this. It would now be about five and a half miles long, with six lanes running up to Prescott Street and then eastward, eventually reducing to four lanes until hitting I-205. City planners still weren't ready to build the freeway quite yet, but the construction of the Fremont Bridge would provide a critical starting point. Part of this project included a set of freeway ramps that led straight into the nearby neighborhoods of the Albina District. This was going to be the connecting segment for the Rose City Freeway once it was built, and in the meantime, the ramps would serve as a street connection to the bridge. The problem was, the neighborhood wanted nothing to do with the freeway. Albina was home to the majority of Portland's black residents, and many of their homes and businesses had already been destroyed by the construction of I-5 a few years earlier. What's worse, the neighboring Emanuel Hospital was getting ready for a big expansion project that would wipe out 19 blocks of the neighborhood and displace 300 homes and businesses. The Rose City Freeway would wipe out more than 1,400 homes on top of this. While planners simply saw it as a blighted area of the city, the residents knew their neighborhood needed investments to help it grow, not tear it apart. In September of 1971, neighborhood groups staged a protest on the recently built freeway ramps. They argued that connecting these to the street network would bring disruptive amounts of traffic, noise, and pollution to the neighborhood. What's more, their rallying cry that the city was building white roads through black bedrooms caused a stir among the city council. They quickly rebutted the idea that the freeway had anything to do with racial prejudice. They also pointed out that the freeway wasn't even confirmed to happen. While the general idea had been around for nearly two decades, they claimed there were still no firm plans to carry it out. It was hard to convince the neighborhood of this, though, when the ramps had been built in their backyard without warning. Two years later, in November of 1973, the Fremont Bridge was finally completed. But the Rose City Freeway ramps still had not been connected to the surface streets, as the neighborhood continued to block this from happening. By this time, most city planners already concluded that the freeway would not be built. But the neighborhood was concerned that opening the ramps would bring in enough traffic to reignite the city's interest. Emanuel Hospital, which was now carrying out its own destruction of the neighborhood, urged the city to open the ramps. They argued that it would provide an important connection for their commuting employees, as well as for emergency vehicles that needed quick access to the bridge. The opposing sides remained in deadlock through the remainder of the 70s, leaving the ramps unused for the better part of a decade. Finally, by fall of 1979, the ramps were connected to the street and open to traffic. Fortunately for the neighborhood, the city had long since given up on any intentions to build the Rose City Freeway. As you travel north across the Fremont Bridge today, you'll see these ramps are still in use for the exit onto Kirby Avenue. This exit is unusual, resembling a freeway for about half a mile before ending in a sharp turn into the street. Perhaps even more striking, though, are three abandoned freeway ramps scattered across the interchange. These are often referred to as ramp stubs or ghost ramps for obvious reasons. These would have been direct connections to the Rose City Freeway. It's hard to know exactly how the flyovers would have been aligned, but they probably would have looked something like this. A couple of these ramp stubs are hard to see while driving, but the northmost one can be clearly spotted from both directions of I-5. In this aerial photo from 1965, before construction began on the bridge, 
you can see two ramp stubs had been built for the future interchange. By the early 70s, the northbound ramp to the Fremont Bridge was constructed as planned, and in turn, it included its own new stub for the upcoming Rose City Freeway. This view is largely the same today, and it's pretty amazing to think that the southbound ramp stub in particular has gone practically untouched since the mid-60s. Of all of Portland's cancelled freeway projects, the Mount Hood Freeway became the most notorious. Once again, our story begins with the original 1955 plan. This east-west route in southeast Portland would have been one of the crown jewels of the city's freeway system, providing a major commuting route between the city center and Gresham. But when the Interstate Highway Program was announced the following year, the Mount Hood Freeway wasn't chosen as one of Portland's first interstates. The Banfield Freeway had just opened, and it already provided the city with an east-west route. It was soon grandfathered into the interstate system instead, and the Mount Hood Freeway was put on the back burner for the next decade. By the mid-60s, the city was exploring several different route options for the outer loop of I-205. In what was called a hot potato of sorts, the city kept eyeing routes for the freeway and then getting pushed out by neighborhood protests. The original plan was for I-205 to cut through Lake Oswego, but its residents harshly criticized these plans and blocked any construction from taking place within the city. As state engineers looked north for other options, they proposed the Mount Hood Freeway as the southern leg of the loop. However, this proposal was rejected, and I-205 was instead pushed much farther south to pass through West Lynn. But the city of Portland was still fully on board with building the Mount Hood Freeway as its own project, even if it couldn't get the full federal funding. The route would split off from I-5 on the east end of the Markham Bridge, which was still under construction at the time. The massive eight-lane highway would have been four city blocks wide, traveling east along the current-day route of Division Street and Powell Boulevard. Spanning just over five miles, it would then intersect with I-205. From here, it would continue east as the Mount Hood Expressway, a less substantial road that would run to the southeast end of Gresham. A third segment would continue at southeastward down to Sandy. As the residents of southeast Portland learned about these plans, their reactions were mixed. Some were receptive to the idea of the new freeway, but most were frustrated. They felt that the city should provide more clear information about the project, and involve them in the planning process. Not the least of their worries was the fact that the freeway would split their neighborhood in half, bulldozing 1% of the entire city's housing market in the process. And with the density of the southeast neighborhoods, some predicted that the freeway would be in gridlock as soon as it opened. Despite the controversy, the Mount Hood Freeway was given another chance to gain interstate status. By the late 60s, the Banfield Freeway had become a choke point for the city's increasing traffic demands, since it was more windy and narrow than the modern standard. If I-80 North could be rerouted to the south instead, this would not only alleviate traffic, but would finally let the city build the Mount Hood Freeway on the federal government's dime. In January of 1969, the Federal Highway Administration approved this new plan, and the city began making preparations to move forward. This began with an environmental impact survey which was completed in 1972. To appease the concern of residents, the survey explored two alternate alignments. But the original Division Powell route was ultimately chosen, and the city began acquiring properties and tearing down houses in preparation. Unsurprisingly, residents were outraged and felt that the city was moving forward without taking their feedback seriously. Fortunately for them, they began to see support from a new generation of local politicians who were equally interested in putting a stop to any more freeways. On top of all this, the U.S. was beginning to experience a severe energy crisis and gasoline shortages. Freeways were making less sense than ever, and the Mount Hood Freeway soon became one of the biggest targets for Portland's freeway protests. It became the poster child for everything that was wrong with the city, from reckless roadway expansion to irresponsible damage to the environment. This widespread belief threatens not only the Mount Hood Freeway itself, but many of the other planned projects around the city, including the industrial and Rose City freeways. Amidst the uproar, the city began to withdraw its support for the freeway in 1974. The construction of I-205 had continued to be controversial as well, and the future was looking grim for both projects. In 1975, local politicians made a compromise. They agreed to cancel the plans for the Mount Hood Freeway, and instead focus their efforts on finishing what they had started with I-205. Despite it never being built, several remnants of the Mount Hood Freeway are still visible today. 
Before the Markham Bridge was even built, it was always designed to accommodate the interchange with the freeway. This amazing scale model from 1962 gives us a clear view of what the interchange would have looked like. For reference, it would have stood right above the current day location of Amzi. Of course, the interchange was never built, but the bridge still has a leftover ramp stub that was built for this purpose. Although there's just one of them now, the bridge originally had several of these ramp stubs when it was first completed in 1966. These were removed in 1990, when the bridge decks were widened to accommodate more lanes of traffic. More evidence of the Mount Hood Freeway can be found if you travel east along its proposed route. Piccolo Park near Division Street uses land where four homes were destroyed in the early 70s in preparation for the freeway. As you continue in the same direction along Powell Boulevard, you can see a series of narrow parking lots that go on for several blocks. These were more properties that the city had cleared out for the freeway in the 70s. As you continue beyond I-205 and approach Gresham, Powell Boulevard bends up into the city central neighborhood. The Mount Hood Expressway would have instead cut southeast through Gresham Butte. At this spot, you'll notice the eastbound and westbound lanes of Route 26 split apart from each other for a short distance. This was designed for the eventual interchange with the Mount Hood Expressway. Of course, since it was never built, this divided section serves no practical purpose today. From this point onward for the next 8 miles, Route 26 actually does take the form of an expressway. This remains the only section of the project that was actually constructed, as it was already completed by the time the rest of the Mount Hood Freeway was cancelled. Although it was a long and arduous fight, Portland's residents proved that their voices were critical to the city's growth and development. But this wasn't simply about canceling freeways. It was about taking a community-centric approach to investing in their shared future. As Portland's freeway projects were canceled one by one, hundreds of millions of dollars of funding were freed up for other projects. Among these was the city's investment in its first max light rail line. When it began service in 1986, the system was one of the first of its kind in the U.S. I think it signals that we've taken yet another step, my friends, together in making Portland and the surrounding area a world-class metropolitan area. Portland's transit network has grown considerably in the years since. Likewise, in the last few decades, the city has earned a reputation as one of the most bike-friendly cities in the country. Investments like these wouldn't have been possible if the city had put all of its funding into building more freeways. Portland isn't perfect by any means, and it will always have its share of challenges. But it's safe to say that the city would look a lot different if it weren't for those community voices who shaped the city as we know it today.